Greetings and welcome to this day number 361 in our reading plan. We're so close to finishing this year in the Bible together. Today our readings are Zechariah 12 and 13, Isaiah 64, and Revelation 18. May the Lord bless you real good today. Several times I have noted Zechariah and other prophets who use the figure of shepherding a flock, picturing God's people. In chapter 11, there were puzzling verses where Zechariah evidently performed an outward demonstration involving two staffs. Other prophets did such demonstrations. In this one, evidently Zechariah stood in for the Messiah. The two staffs were named Favor and Union. Our Messiah Jesus came to restore us to God's favor and to give us unity as God's people, no matter from what race. The thirty pieces of silver is spoken of with irony, this magnificent sum at which they valued me. Remember this shepherd picture. Zechariah 12 This message concerning the fate of Israel came from the Lord. This message is from the Lord who stretched out the heavens, laid the foundations of the earth, and formed the human spirit. I will make Jerusalem like an intoxicating drink that makes the nearby nations stagger when they send their armies to besiege Jerusalem and Judah. On that day I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock. All the nations will gather against it to try to move it, but they will only hurt themselves. On that day, says the Lord, I will cause every horse to panic and every rider to lose his nerve. I will watch over the people of Judah, but I will blind all the horses of their enemies. And the clans of Judah will say to themselves, The people of Jerusalem have found strength in the Lord of heaven's armies, their God. On that day I will make the clans of Judah like a flame that sets a woodpile ablaze, or like a burning torch among sheaves of grain. They will burn up all the neighboring nations right and left, while the people living in Jerusalem remain secure. The Lord will give victory to the rest of Judah first, before Jerusalem, so that the people of Jerusalem and the royal line of David will not have greater honor than the rest of Judah. On that day, the Lord will defend the people of Jerusalem. The weakest among them will be as mighty as King David, and the royal descendants will be like God, like the angel of the Lord who goes before them. For on that day I will begin to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Then I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the family of David and on the people of Jerusalem. They will look on me whom they have pierced, and mourn for him as for an only son. They will grieve bitterly for him as for a firstborn son who has died. The sorrow and mourning in Jerusalem on that day will be like the great mourning for Hadadorimon in the valley of Megiddo. All Israel will mourn, each clan by itself, and with the husbands separate from their wives. The clan of David will mourn alone, as will the clan of Nathan, the clan of Levi, and the clan of Shimei. Each of the surviving clans from Judah will mourn separately and with the husbands separate from their wives. Zechariah 13 On that day a fountain will be opened for the dynasty of David and for the people of Jerusalem, a fountain to cleanse them from all their sins and impurity. On that day, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will erase idol worship throughout the land, so that even the names of the idols will be forgotten. I will remove from the land both the false prophets and the spirit of impurity that came with them. If anyone continues to prophesy, his own father and mother will tell him, You must die, for you have prophesied lies in the name of the Lord." 
and as he prophesies, his own father and mother will stab him. On that day, people will be ashamed to claim the prophetic gift. No one will pretend to be a prophet by wearing prophet's clothes. He will say, I'm no prophet, I'm a farmer. I began working for a farmer as a boy. And if someone asks, Then what about those wounds on your chest? He will say, I was wounded at my friend's house. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, the man who is my partner, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Strike down the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered, and I will turn against the lambs. Two-thirds of the people in the land will be cut off and die, says the Lord, but one-third will be left in the land. I will bring that group through the fire and make them pure. I will refine them like silver and purify them like gold. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, These are my people, and they will say, The Lord is our God. We turn to Isaiah 64. Yesterday, in chapter 63, we heard the people of Israel ask a whole series of questions about the Lord, like, Where is the one who brought Israel through the sea with Moses as their shepherd? And here is another verse. Lord, look down from heaven, look from your holy, glorious home, and see us. Where is the passion and the might you used to show on our behalf? Where are your mercy and compassion now? The chapter ended with deep pathos. How briefly your holy people possessed your holy place, and now your enemies have destroyed it. Sometimes it seems as though we never belong to you, as though we had never been known as your people. However, don't forget how the chapter started, with the Lord wearing blood-stained robes from trampling out the grapes, yes, grapes of wrath, the nations who oppressed his people. This is a picture of the grape harvest that we saw so recently in Revelation 14. Note that in Isaiah, the Lord does the trampling alone. And so we see also in Revelation, the final battle is won by the Lord acting alone. Isaiah 64 Oh, that you would burst from the heavens and come down! How the mountains would quake in your presence! As fire causes wood to burn and water to boil, your coming would make the nations tremble. Then your enemies would learn the reason for your fame. When you came down long ago, you did awesome deeds beyond our highest expectations. And oh, how the mountains quaked! For since the world began, No ear has heard and no eye has seen a God like you who works for those who wait for him. You welcome those who gladly do good, who follow godly ways. But you have been very angry with us, for we are not godly. We are constant sinners. How can people like us be saved? We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. Yet no one calls on your name or pleads with you for mercy. Therefore you have turned away from us and turned us over to our sins. And yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We all are formed by your hand. Don't be so angry with us, Lord. Please don't remember our sins forever. Look at us, we pray, and see that we are your people. Your holy cities are destroyed. 
Zion is a wilderness. Yes, Jerusalem is a desolate ruin. The holy and beautiful temple where our ancestors praised you has been burned down and all the things of beauty are destroyed. After all this, Lord, must you still refuse to help us? Will you continue to be silent and punish us? We turn to Revelation 18. The part that puzzles me most in chapter 17 is this. The beast you saw was once alive but isn't now. And yet he will soon come up out of the bottomless pit and go to eternal destruction. And the people who belong to this world, whose names were not written in the book of life before the world was made, will be amazed at the reappearance of this beast who has died. Satan's sponsorship of the beast is clear. But how will this eighth king reveal himself as someone who previously died so that people actually believe it and are amazed? Revelation 18 After this I saw another angel come down from heaven with great authority, and the earth grew bright with his splendor. He gave a mighty shout, Babylon is fallen! That great city is fallen. She has become a home for demons. She is a hideout for every foul spirit, a hideout for every foul vulture and every foul and dreadful animal. For all the nations have fallen because of the wine of her passionate immorality. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her. Because of her desires for extravagant luxury, the merchants of the world have grown rich. Then I heard another voice calling from heaven. Come away from her, my people. Do not take part in her sins, or you will be punished with her. For her sins are piled up as high as heaven, and God remembers her evil deeds. Do to her as she has done to others. Double her penalty for all her evil deeds. She brewed a cup of terror for others, so brew twice as much for her. She glorified herself and lived in luxury, so match it now with torment and sorrow. She boasted in her heart, I am queen on my throne. I am no helpless widow, and I have no reason to mourn. Therefore, these plagues will overtake her in a single day, death and mourning and famine. She will be completely consumed by fire, for the Lord God who judges her is mighty. And the kings of the world who committed adultery with her and enjoyed her great luxury will mourn for her as they see the smoke rising from her charred remains. They will stand at a distance, terrified by her great torment. They will cry out, How terrible, how terrible for you, O Babylon, you great city. In a single moment, God's judgment came on you. The merchants of the world will weep and mourn for her, for there is no one left to buy their goods. She bought great quantities of gold, silver, jewels, and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet cloth, things made of fragrant thyine wood, ivory goods, and objects made of expensive wood, and bronze, iron, and marble. She also bought cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, olive oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots, and bodies, that is, human slaves. The merchants cry, The fancy things you loved so much are gone. All your luxuries and splendor are gone forever, never to be yours again. The merchants who became wealthy by selling her these things will stand at a distance, terrified by her great torment. They will weep and cry out, How terrible! How terrible for that great city! She was clothed in finest purple and scarlet linens, decked out with gold and precious stones and pearls. In a single moment all the wealth of the great city is gone. 
and all the captains of the merchant ships and their passengers and sailors and crews will stand at a distance. They will cry out as they watch the smoke ascend, and they will say, Where is there another city as great as this? And they will weep and throw dust on their heads to show their grief, and they will cry out, How terrible! How terrible for the great city! The ship owners became wealthy by transporting her great wealth on the seas. In a single moment, it is all gone. Rejoice over her fate, O heaven, and people of God and apostles and prophets. For at last God has judged her for your sakes. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a huge millstone. He threw it into the ocean and shouted, Just like this, the great city Babylon will be thrown down with violence and will never be found again. The sound of harps, singers, flutes, and trumpets will never be heard in you again. No craftsmen and no trades will ever be found in you again. The sound of the mill will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The happy voices of brides and grooms will never be heard in you again. For your merchants were the greatest in the world, and you deceived the nations with your sorceries. In your streets flowed the blood of the prophets and of God's holy people, and the blood of people slaughtered all over the world. Let's praise the Lord together for what we have read. Our sovereign Lord and our Creator, our God, the God who created the heavens, Since the world began, no ear has heard and no eye has seen a God like you, who works for those who wait for him. And Father, you did something that people did not expect. You said of your partner, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, the man who is my partner says the Lord of heaven's armies. Strike down the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And this happened when the Lord Jesus was betrayed and died. And you said in Zechariah 13, On that day a fountain will be opened for the dynasty of David and for the people of Jerusalem a fountain to cleanse them from all their sins and impurity. Thank you, Father, for the fountain that you opened up that is healing for us, a fountain that makes all things new, that changes salt water into fresh water, and a stream where the trees of life grow on both sides. Father, we thank you that you have won the victory for us and that we are one with Christ Jesus. Therefore, in other scripture, such as in Ephesians, it says that we are seated with him, in him, in the heavenly realms. Therefore, our Father, we pray that you would give us heavenly minds and heavenly vision that we can understand the judgment that you will bring against the world. A judgment that is not cruel, but that is just, that pays back the world for the injustices that have been done. In fact, a judgment that answers the prayers that we have prayed for justice. Thank you for your victory over Babylon and the world system. We long for the day when the evils in this world will be no more, and we will be with you. So we pray, help us to live today with a heavenly vision.